COG webcast sponsored by the Judeo-Christian Foundation. You know, among religious people, among Christians, there has been, and there, you know, historically and continues to be a great deal of discussion, one might even say confusion, over the future of what is, you know, the reward of the saints. What is the kingdom of God? You know, what's a saint to do? Are we going to be going to heaven and just sitting around plucking on our harps and all those sorts of things? You know, the scriptures actually reveal some remarkable things. And we're going to take a look at some of these and say, you know, so we all have a better understanding when we look at these scriptures of the kingdom of God and the role of God's people, the role of God's saints in that kingdom and changing this world. Turn with me to Daniel 7 and verse 18. Daniel 7 and verse 18. Now, before I begin reading, you know, Jesus made the very strong point you know, both in Matthew 4, 4, he's, you know, that we are to live by every word of God. And that is concludes our hope for the future. And he also mentioned in uh, Matthew 5 and 17 to 19, you know, he didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. That means including when we were talking about uh, when I cite the uh, Old Covenant scriptures, when I cite the prophets, you know, th they're just as valid for us as Christians. They're not just a thought that was in the past, you know, or something that's, that's no longer relevant to us. It's highly relevant to us who are Christians, who are at this time. So turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, and let's start with verse 18. We're going to skip around a little bit in this chapter of Daniel 7. Daniel 7 and verse 18 breaking into the middle of this, but the saints of the Most High, the saints, it's very interesting, the Strong's, the, the word here in Hebrew is uh, Strong 69.22, it's Kadesh, it's an adjective for holy. The New Living Translation uh, translates saints, it'll say holy people. Amplified Bible would add believer. The expanded Bible would say the holy ones. So those who are holy, you know, it's an adjective, the people, the whole, you know, the holy people. And why are they holy? It's because they're so closely identified with God and his values and what he believes and what he teaches. And his holy ones are those who are, you know, have the, his indwelling presence by his Holy Spirit, and that's what makes them holy. But the saints, the holy people, the believers, the holy ones, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. You know, that, that, you know that, I mean, that's being emphatic. That, that is saying, you know, it is going to happen and nobody's going to yank it away. You know, in this world, when we have kingdoms, we have empires, you know, they, they come and they go. At this point in time, of course, we can see the American empire is fading. You know, all the, what I grew up with from the time that I was born to, to right now, you know, the United States has been the, you know, world superpower, but it's deteriorating. It's degrading. You can see it right and left. <laughs> it's, it's all over the place. Only the blind can't see that, or who stubbornly or willfully, you know, willfully blind people can't see that. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Verse 21, Daniel goes on in this prophecy, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints. So here was a, a prophetic bad guy, an evil guy, identified symbolically as a horn, you can read the rest of the chapter to get the picture, was making war against God's holy people and prevailing against them. It was, you know, it was pushing, you know, it was defeating them. It, it was putting them in a very hard place. And this was happening. It was prevailing against them when? Until the Ancient of Days came 
and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Verse 25, Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And he, this horn, this little horn, shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> the, you know we, have, we have the whole things of the man of sin, you know, the coming and standing into the, you know, coming into the holy place and all this sort of stuff. And he shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute, or as the Coulter translation puts it, wear out. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the set times and laws. So the saints are human beings, and this bad guy, who's uh, one of the seed of Satan, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. I mean, it's be your classic case of, of bad versus good. And he, and this uh, bad guy is going. He see he intends to change the set times and laws. He wants to, he wants to monkey around with how God has set things up. Then, but then it says, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time, three and a half years. So there's a real period of time of trial and tribulation for God's people. The saints are given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But however, verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion, and the word dominion, the New Living translates it, sovereignty and power. Then sovereignty and power, the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. So we have a future. The scriptures talk very clearly in, in Daniel 7. The saints have a future. Yes, there are, you know, there's trials and tribulations coming. Because with a, with a, with a great future and a great reward, it's, 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 there's a, this is a great deal that's uh, suffering and, and pain and heartache that has to go through to, to, to show that, you know, we, you know, we are truly worthy of this kingdom, that we can be overcomers. This is something that's important. So it's a very foundational teaching in scriptures. But it's making the point here the kingdom of God is something that is going to have sovereignty, is going to have power, and it's not going to be temporary. It's going to be, once it happens, it's a permanent situation. Let's go to another of the prophets. Let's go to prophets. The prophet Zechariah is one of the quote, quote, you know, they call minor prophets. That just as their prophecies are shorter, their books are shorter. Uh, the prophet Zechariah, and verse 14 and f verse 5, we'll see something else about what's a saint to do here. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 5, and I'm going to cite this in the New uh, King James Version. It says, I'm breaking into the middle of this prophecy, Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall stretch to Azal. Okay, this is talking about in Judah, in, in the promised land. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. So this is a prophecy that when God comes, the saints will be, you know, all the saints of God will be with him. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13. I'm staying with the New King James Version for a moment here. And may the Lord make you increase, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. May the Lord make you increase, Paul is writing to the church, and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. You know, because in, in the New Covenant Scriptures, love is very important. And agape love, which is the which is you know the most godly form, is is it's what you do to another person, which is for their benefit. It's not just an emotion or a feeling. Love is something that you do that is for another person's benefit. 
that in, in, in Paul is wishing to the church then in Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Verse 13, so that he, that is God, may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. When Christ comes, he doesn't come just by himself. He comes with all his saints. Because Paul explains, you know, earlier, you know, he explains in, in you know, um, 1 Corinthians 15 that you have the resurrection. <laughs> you have this whole process that is going on. And the, the saints will rise, those that are dead with Christ and those who are, who are alive will meet up with them and they will, be, they will actually come with our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, what are they to do? You know, God, he didn't call us. <laughs> he's not preparing us. He's not putting us through all the things we're going through in this life to no purpose. It's not over. We're not going into retirement to do nothing, but putter around somehow. No, he's got a, he's got work for us to do. If if you go to First Corinthians chapter six and verse two, First Corinthians six and verse two, Amplified Bible version, Paul saying to the Corinthian Greeks who had repented of their sins, been baptized, had hands laid on them, had received the Holy Spirit, and he said to them. Do you not know that the saints, that is God's people, will one day judge the world? Now he's referring to prophecies. He's referring to everything that was there in the scripture, saying that there is a future, there is a coming kingdom of God. This kingdom, again referring back to Daniel 7, that this kingdom, you know, who is it's going to be, it's an everlasting kingdom, and it is given. You know, to the saints. It'll be something that they, the saints, to possess the kingdom. There is this time that's coming. And so Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 6 2, don't you know that the saints will one day judge the world? What does that mean? He's going to judge the world. If the world is to be judged by you, are you not competent to try trivial, insignificant, that is, petty cases? You know, since this is your future, right now here in the church and managing your affairs in Corinth, you know, can't you, do, among in your congregation, can't you take care of trivial cases, he's saying to the church? You know, we have a real problem in the, and have long had a problem in the churches of God of establishing justice and righteousness when people do things that are wrong. I've seen in the congregation that there is actually administration of justice. It's very ad hoc as it goes. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, whatever the minister tends to feel or when he gets annoyed with somebody, he'll throw him out or something like this. But the church is far more than a minister. The church is all the people. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, you know, <laughs> he's, he's saying to them, don't you know <laughs> the saints will one day judge the world? <laughs> aren't you, you know, in the meantime, aren't you competent? Can't you get it, your act together to take care of the problems that you have in your congregation? See, there's a bigger job coming. You have responsibilities to, you know, to perform right now. You're supposed to be learning through the experiences you have. Because one day in the future, you're going to judge in the kingdom of God, the human people. That's who's going to need it. I mean, those will be the people who, are, who haven't been resurrected, who are not saints, who have not, you know, <laughs> or not in the spirit, they're still in the flesh. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28 in the Gospels. Matthew 19 and verse 28. The kingdom of God was very important in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He came preaching the kingdom of God and telling people to repent. But he said to me, he said to the disciples specifically, 
to those who were called to be saints, to be God's holy people. He said to them, Matthew 19, verse 28, I'm going to cite this in the Phillips translation. He says, believe me, said Jesus, when I tell you that in the next world, in the next world, when the Son of Man shall sit down on his glorious throne, and you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones and become judges of the twelve tribes of Israel. Wait a minute here, it says. Believe me, when I tell you in the next world, here the word in Greek is Strong's 3824. Pelagenesia, that is, means regeneration, renewal. The Holman Christian Standard Bible tra uh, translates as the Messianic Age. You know, unlike uh, Bible Hub Lexicon puts it, in the regeneration. I tell you that Jesus would say, in the next world, in the regeneration, in the renewal. And this is this idea of renewal, of regeneration, of a new world or is, is, is developed. Also, it's mentioned, there's another word uh, used for this in Acts 3.21. In Acts 3.21, referring to Jesus Christ, it goes, and whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. So Jesus is not here. He ascended to heaven until, and the disciples were told, Till, until the times of restoration of all things. The Greek word here is strong, 605, different word. It's apokata stasis, apokata stasis, which means restitution, reestablishment. Rest, you know, it is, it is the restoration. It's the restoration on the physical earth of the mess, messianic kingdom. The Greek um, scholar who, and who, who put together a pretty good lexicon of the Greek biblical language, Thayer, says, the restoration not only of true theocracy, but also of a more perfect state of even physical things which existed before Adam and Eve's sin. Which is, you know... He says, you know, Jesus Christ, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. This has been a theme that God has had his prophets rehearse to God's people and ever since ancient times, ever, you know, since this time of Adam and Eve, you know, when, when, when he had the world corrupted because of sin. So, going back to Matthew 19, we'll start verse 28. Believe me, said Jesus, when I tell you that in the next world, when the Son of Man shall sit down on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones and become judges of the twelve tribes of Israel. Every man who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or land for my sake will receive it all back many times over and will inherit eternal life. So you not only you know, are the other material blessings promised, but there's eternal life. Then he says, but many who are first now will be last then and the last first. When Jesus promised those disciples that they would become judges of the 12 tribes of Israel, what was he saying? The Greek word here is Strong's 2919. Another Greek word, krino, very simple word, krino, properly to separate. In Homer, you know, in, in the ancient Greek, it was, you know, it was originally the idea was separating the wheat from the chaff. So properly to separate, i.e. meant, uh, you know, uh, figuratively, to judge, to come to a choice, a decision, a judgment. By making a judgment, it could be a positive judgment, a verdict in favor of something, or a negative judgment, which rejects or condemns. Crino typically refers, according to the lexicon, to making a determination of right or wrong, innocence or guilt, especially on an official stand, uh, legal standard. 
in the lexicon as this, that in Crino, we, you know, who, who are Christians, only judge accurately by intelligent comparison and contrast based on the word of God to approve or prefer what is correct and to reject what is inferior or what is wrong. This is why, you know, when Paul was saying, you know, do you not know that the saints will one day judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are you not competent to try trivial, insignificant, petty cases? Don't you have the scriptures on hand? Of course you do. We should be able to do that. We ought to be doing that. Hebraistically, that is to say, you know, when you look at the idea of to judge or to be a judge according to the way it was presented in the Hebrew Bible, it, if you were a judge, it was equivalent to, to rule, to govern. You have that whole book of judges. These were people who were rulers or governors over the people of Israel. They, they presided over the people with power. They gave not only judicial decisions, but they would lead the people into battle against their enemies. To judge was a prerogative in ancient times always of kings and rulers. If you were a king or a ruler, that was one of your, you know, that was one of the essential parts of your service to your people. Let's go to Luke 22 and verse 25 in the Gospels. You know, what is to be the nature of being a judge, being a ruler? Luke 22 and verse 25, Philip's translation. But Jesus said to them, <laughs> you know, talking to his disciples, among the heathen it is their kings who lord it over them, and their rulers are given the title of benefactors. You see, this is one of the great hypocrisies of the Romans. They would call, you know, some judge or some ruler over the people that they would put over a captive people. They call them a benefactor. They're supposed to do them good. I mean, that's what the title said, but what were they really doing? But it must not be so with you. See, they all knew that that was just pure hypocrisy among the Greco-Romans. Your greatest man, Jesus was saying, must become like a junior, and your leader must be a servant. Who is the greater, the man who sits down to table or the man who serves him? Obviously, the man who sits down to table. Yet I am the one who is a servant among you. See, this whole idea is he's making a direct metaphor towards waiting on tables. Hopefully, when you go to a restaurant or something and somebody waits on you, hopefully you treat them well. <laughs> hopefully you treat them well. If you were sitting at a table and Jesus serves you, would you treat them well or would you look down on them? Well, many people don't treat service people very well. But anyways, it says, so who is the greater, the, one, the man who sits down to dinner or the man who serves him? It's obviously the man who sits down to dinner. Yet I, Jesus said, am the one who is the servant among you. But you are the men who have stood by me in all that I have gone through. You know, saying to, you know, Peter and John and James and Bartholomew, all these people. And as surely as my father has given me my kingdom. See, he's making a direct claim on the prophecies in Daniel, on all the rest of the prophecies of God preparing a kingdom in the Hebrew Bible. As surely as my Father has given me my kingdom, so I give you the right to eat and drink at my table in that kingdom. You are in the inner group. You're part of my cabinet, as it were. And then it says, yes, you will sit on thrones and rule the 12 tribes of Israel. Their future was to rule, to be a governor. And that, that fact of being a service to the people, being a servant leader, actually being a true benefactor to the people, helping them, discerning what was right from what was wrong, you know, picking out the guilty from the innocent, all these things. Let's go to Psalm 122 and verse 4. So you'll sit, you know, Jesus said in Luke 22, you'll sit on the thrones and rule the 12 tribes of Israel. It's interesting because the Psalms, is a, this is an interesting psalm, and it ref, sort of refers on that. Psalm 122 and verse 4 to 5, Amplified Bible. And breaking into the middle of the psalm for brevity. 
to which the 12 tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, you know, as was decreed in scriptures, as an ordinance for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. You know, on holy day you descend to Jerusalem, you know, on the, 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 the festival of Stephen's unleavened bread, Pentecost, the feast, uh, feast of tabernacles, for, uh, to give thanks to the Lord, for there the thrones of judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. If you had a problem in ancient Israel, you could go up to Jerusalem and go before the throne of David, which, you know, they'd be publicly out there among the people and ask for justice. If you had a case. It's very interesting. I, I looked up uh, this particular, the thrones of the house of David. And in Luke 22, yes, you will sit on thrones and rule the 12 tribes of Israel. Beale and Carson, in their commentary of the New Testament use of the Old Testament, says, it should be noted, and I'm quoting, in Luke's context, Luke 22, verse 30, Luke's context, the word throne are kingly thrones, for ruling are not restricted to judging. Because, of course, if you were a judge, you know, in the Hebrew, that meant you were a ruler. You had all sorts of, this wasn't just legal responsibility, it was civil responsibilities too. Jesus' statement in Luke 22, verse 30, yes, you will sit on thrones and rule the 12 tribes of Israel, you know, does directly again go back to Daniel chapter 7 and that passages of scripture of 9 to 18. Let's go to Daniel 7, 9 to 18. I'm going to cite the, I'll quote it here in the Amplified Bible version. Daniel in prophecy. I said, I kept looking until thrones, plural, were set up. And the ancient of days, you know, God the Father, took his seat. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was flames of fire. The wheels were at uh, were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming from before him. A thousand thousands were attending him, and ten thousands times ten thousand were standing before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. So we see the you know this legal proceeding beginning. It's part of ruling is also to judge. Then I kept looking because the sound of the great and boastful words which the horn, going back to this uh, representation of uh, an evil, end time evil one, was speaking. And I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, these representations of Gentile powers, their power was taken away, yet their lives were prolonged. <laughs> and then it said, for the length of their lives was fixed for a predetermined time. Verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, on the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This was Jesus. And this was, you know, he's coming on the, on the clouds of heaven. This was what he even, <laughs> Jesus said, you, you're going to see me coming on the clouds of heaven. He even mentioned this in, in his trial, you know, for his life before he was crucified. This is one of the things that got him condemned. <clears throat> and so he was coming to the, on the clouds of heaven, one like the angel, uh, son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, the Messiah, was given dominion. That is supreme authority, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and speakers of every language should serve and worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Verse 15 Okay, and here the, Daniel's vision is going to be interpreted to him. As, as for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed and anxious within me, the prophet wrote. And the visions that appeared in my mind kept alarming, kept agitating me. Verse 16, and I approached one of those who stood by, an angel, and began asking the exact meaning of all this. And he told me and explained to me the interpretation of these things, these you know, he has these visions, so you have to read the whole chapter to see it. But he had four great beasts or four kings will rise from the earth. 
So there'll all be all these Gentile hostile powers for the most part that would govern large parts of the earth. But it says the point is that I want to make and the point of this point of the scripture is in verse 18 and he said but the saints that is the believers of the most high will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come yes the world has been in the hands of the various kingdoms throughout the history of time you know, Assyrians, Babylonians, <laughs> various Greco-Roman you know, powers. And in our time, you know, we have our current political powers, don't we? But it's saying, but in the future, the future is this. The saints, the believers of the Most High, will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. And all nations and languages are going to serve this kingdom, going to serve Jesus Christ. Let's go to Psalm 149, 9, New King James Version. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples. Because they judge. And sometimes the judgment is for positive reasons and sometimes it's for punishment to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Because there are many, you know, these are destroying the earth. They're oppressing their own people. To execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. So not only is the sentence passed, but one of the jobs of the saints is to carry it out to transform this world. And to transform this world, you know, is going to take power. But that's what is coming. The kingdom of God is, is not just a nice uh, little, you know, a warm, fuzzy idea. It is talking about remaking, regenerating, rest, restoration of what God's plan is. There is going to be a restoration and regeneration of the earth. It is coming. It's going to happen. It's, of course, it's desperately needed, desperately needed right now. But it is yet future. But it is a promise. It's a promise that we as Christians must believe because it is essential. You know, if we're going to survive and remain standing, you know, up until, through all the things and the persecution and the difficulties we're going to face, we must have a vision of the future and what our role is going to be in that future. What the reward is. It's that it's worth whatever, you know, hardships we may have to go through. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. I'm going to cite this one in the message. It's paraphrased, but I, I liked it. Matthew 19 and verse 28. Jesus replied, Yes, you have followed me. You know, speaking of the disciples. In the rege recreation of the world. Okay, here is, <laughs> this is that lovely word, Greek word, pelagensia, the regeneration, the renewal. And, the, you know, the, the, this thing, you and the recreation of the world, when the Son of Man will rule gloriously, you who have followed me will also rule, starting with the 12 tribes of Israel. And not only you, but anyone who sacrifices home, family, fields, whatever, because of me, will get it back a hundred times over, not to mention the considerable bonus of eternal life. This is the great reversal. Many of the first ending up last and the last first. You know, they talk about the great reset. <laughs> you know, 
you know, what the Bible process, uh, promises this is a great reversal. <laughs> that all these ruling elites that are corrupting the world right now will find themselves on the bottom of the totem pole. Many of the first ending up last and the last first. Let's go to Isaiah 49. The prophet Isaiah 49 and verse 7. Isaiah 49 and verse 7. This is what the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, Israel's Holy One, says. To the thoroughly despised one, to the one hated by the nation. Oh, who are we talking about? To the servant of rulers. We're talking about Jesus of Nazareth, glorified as King of kings and Lord of lords. A servant of rulers. Kings will see and arise. Princes shall also bow down in respect in recognition of Christ's authority. Because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, has chosen you. This is what the Lord says. In a favorable time, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. And I will keep watch over you and give you for a covenant of the people to restore the land from its present state of degeneration, of ruin, and to apportion and give as inheritances the deserted hereditary lands. You know, here in Canada right now, many of uh, the Aboriginal tribes are looking to have get back their hereditary lands. Well, one of the things that has been promised is that in a day of salvation, you know, that he's giving, you know, Christ will have the mission to restore the land and to reapportion its inheritance, its deserted hereditary land. The, you know, the, the, because most people wandering around, how many people are no longer living on their hereditary lands? They're refugees. They're migrants. Because they, they left because they felt it was essential for their survival or to have a future. Isaiah 49, verse 9. So he said, again, part of it, saying to those who are bound and captured, go forth, and to those who are in spiritual darkness, show yourself, you know, come to the light of the Savior. They will feed along the roads in which they travel, and their pasture so will be on all the bare heights. They will not hunger nor thirst, nor will the scorching heat nor strung sun uh, strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them, and he will guide them to springs of water. A great migrant caravan returning to their allotted inheritances. And I will make all my mountains a roadway, and my highways will be raised. In fact, these will come from far away, and lo, these shall come from the north and from the west and from the land of Aswan, in the southern Egypt. Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. God will perform what he needs to. He will reform, you know, he, in the restoration, he will, one of the things is restoring the ancient inheritances. Isaiah 58 and verse 12, Isaiah 58 and verse 12, New Living Translation. Some of you will, will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as rebuilder of walls and restorer of homes. And the kingdom of God, when it comes, see, it's, it's not magic. It, it, it will get to a state of restoring and regenerating the earth once the kingdom of God is reestablished. You know, once you have the restoration of God's rule, act of rule, theocracy on this world then it will be a process. Bit by bit by bit, you will start to reverse the destruction and the ruin. 
This is what the scriptures are, so, are showing. And since we're promised, you know, since as Paul said, you know, that we're going to be judges in the, in the world ahead, in, in, this, in this restoration, in the kingdom of God, behooves us to pay attention to what he is saying to us. God is going to bring back people to the deserted inheritance. In Jeremiah 33, 7, He's prophesied, and I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return and will rebuild those places as at the first. It's not even close. Now, a lot of people from Judah have returned, but not the people of Israel. Twelve tri you know, the ten tribes were different from the, the, the southern two tribes. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 35. Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse um, 25. Now this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will end the captivity of my people and I will have mercy on all Israel for I jealously guarded my holy rep reputation. God's name is holy to him and he guards his reputation. They will accept responsibility for their past shame and unfaithfulness after they come home to live in peace in their own land with no one to bother them. So a lot of people will start to know that God really is God, that he is the God of the Bible when they actually come home and they actually have peace. They go back to the land of their inheritance where they won't be troubled and oppressed. When I bring them home from the land, verse 27, Ezekiel 39, verse 27, when I bring them home from the lands of their enemies, when they were captive, I will display my holiness among them for all the nations to see. Okay, God has a plan. He always did. The, you know, from in the, in the story of ancient Israel, was they were to be an example nation. They were to be a nation of kings and priests. This is what He said to them in in, in uh, Exodus 19. You know, before the Ten Commandments, He said, "You know, I, this was one of this is what God wanted them to be." They, he wanted them to be a holy nation, to be a, a, an example for the rest of the world. But of course, they failed massively in that. Just as most of the Western world has failed massively to actually put into practice what the scriptures say, even though we have it right and left and it's been all over the place. And yet now, of course, we see the leaders in the United States, Canada, Britain, and wherever else in the Western world who, who were at one time, who you used to say they're Christian, now most of them do not. The overwhelming majority do not. And certainly the leaders don't believe anything in the book. And they, you know, their policies and whatever are contradictory. Anyways. God will once again display his holiness through ancient Israel, through the, the dirt of descendants, their modern descendants for all nations to see. He's, that God is faithful to his word. He is going to restore them. Micah chapter 4 and verse 2, another prophecy would show that many nations shall come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is one of, going to be one of the major jobs of the saints in the kingdom of God. Because not only are you exercising, you know, from the standpoint civil authority and legal authority, but there's going to be a religious responsibility to teach God's law, the law of his Torah, his teachings, his way of life, what is the way of righteousness as opposed to the way of unrighteousness, what is faithful as opposed to what is unfaithful. So, so let's go back. Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 28. Ezekiel 39 and verse 28. After the people accept responsibility for their past shame and their unfaithfulness and come home to live in peace and in their own land and no one to bother them, and God's going to display his holiness, you know, through them for all the nations to see, he says, 
Verse 28, then my people will know that I am the Lord their God because I sent them away to exile and brought them home again. God punished them and then he forgave them and brought them back to their, uh, their, their land. I will leave none of my people behind and I will never again turn my face for them for I will pour out my spirit upon the people of Israel. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. And this would only be possible in the future time after Christ's sacrifice and resurrection where his, he made it possible that he, because he did sacrifice himself as, as the Passover lamb and he was raised from that, it made it possible to have the Holy Spirit. He said, you know, this was, this was essential for the, for the disciples. Let's go to Isaiah 61, Isaiah 61. So what are the saints going to do in the kingdom of God? Now, this is a very important scripture. This was, in fact, when Jesus started his ministry in Galilee. He began, you know, as, as his opening statement. This is inaugural preaching of what his ministry was about. He said this, Isaiah 61 and verse 1. He cited this scripture. You can see that in the Gospels. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It was the Lord has anointed and commissioned me to bring good news to the humble and afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted, to proclaim release, that is, from confinement and condemnation, to the captives, whether physical or spiritual, both, and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, this is the same as the day of salvation that would be referred to in Isaiah 49 and verse 8, and the day of vengeance and retribution of our God. You see, Jesus didn't go so far. He just stopped here in the first part of verse 2 of Isaiah 61. Because when he rent to proclaim, you know, a favorable day of the Lord, a favorable year of the Lord, that's where he stopped. And then he sat down in the synagogue. But you see, the rest of it was yet to be fulfilled. It's part of the prophecy. Because the next part is, it says, and the day of vengeance and retribution of our God. This day of vengeance and retribution is mentioned in Isaiah 63, 4. For the day of vengeance, that is against ungodliness, was in my heart, in my year of redemption. That is, of those who put their trust in, in the Messiah, and the year of my redeemed has come. See, there is a time and a fulfillment of this. And it goes on to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion the following, to give them a turban instead of dust. You know, dust being on the, and you'd throw dust on your head, it's a sign of mourning. The oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment expressive of praise instead of a disheartened spirit. So they shall be called trees of righteousness. God's saints will be called trees of righteousness. You know, they are strong and magnificent, distinguished for their integrity, justice, and right standing with God, as, as the Amplified draws out. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And what are they going to do? And they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up and restore the former desolations. They will renew the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. And then it goes on in verse 5, because, you know, with all this happens, the strangers will stand and feed your flocks. There are going to be all sorts of people who are going to be where the action is. But you shall be called, as the saints will be called, the priests of the Lord. People will speak of you as ministers of our God. See, we're promised to be kings and priests. This is what Apostle Peter was talking about. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. You know, right now, where are we at this time? 
right now, of course, the problem is people don't have someone, you don't have those in authority judging them rightly, deciding, you know, what is right from what is wrong. They can't do it because they're not basing what they're judging on the word of God. Instead, they're doing it on man's law, human interpretation of <laughs> man's law. Man's law is, is, is quite departed in many cases these days from God's law. Isaiah 30 and verse 20 makes this point. Because you know, the, the people will eventually accept responsibility for what they did wrong. Well, that is not yet. But Isaiah 30 and verse 20 says this. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, you know, because you, you wouldn't do what was right, you refused to do what was right, the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink. Though God did this, he will still be with you to teach you. When God punishes, it's not to destroy. It's because he wants people to change. God came, that you know, and he, he sacrificed himself, not that he would destroy all life, but that he might save it. He will still be with you to teach you. Then it's, it points out in this prophecy that you will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. There will be a time when you know, God you know, gives his people to be judging of the world to come. We'll be there. It'll be our responsibility with you know, whatever area that, it, that we might be asked to do this in, the people will be our responsibility. We'll be there to help them, to teach them, to guide them. This is the way you should go. You know, whether it's the right or the left, verse 22, then you will destroy all your silver idols and your precious gold images, you know, your idolatry. You will throw them out like filthy rags and say to them, good riddance. Then the Lord will bless you with rain at planting time, and there will be wonderful harvests and plenty of pasture land for your livestock. You all sorts of physical people. You know, if you still need rain, you still need your harvest. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Go to verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, church of brotherly love, write, These things says the Holy One, the one who is true, the one who has the key of David. Yeah, he sits on the throne of David. Who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. You see into this church. Behold, I have set before you an open door and no one has uh, the power to shut it because you have a little strength and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who proclaim themselves to be Jews. They say they're spiritual people. They say they're the chosen ones, and are not, but do lie, because they're not. Behold, I will make them to come and, and worship before your feet. It would be idolatry if they weren't, you know, God's people part of God's, his adopted children, part of his family, and to know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my patience. I will also keep you from the time of temptation that is about to come upon the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one may take away your crown. The one who overcomes... Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall not go out any more? Have the responsibility of teaching the law to all those who come up from all the nations to Jerusalem. 
And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which will come down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. The one who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And finally, chapter 3 here in verse 21, to the one who overcomes will I give authority to sit with me in my throne. They will have with, we will have with Christ. See, what does a saint do with Christ? We are going to have, you know, we're going to have the responsibility, the opportunity to serve humanity as their judges, as a ruler, as a royal priest to teach people what is the right way to go. To sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. The one who overcomes, will I give authority to sit with me in my throne? The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The kingdom of God is promised. What's a saint to do? Well, our, our job is laid out for us. We're going to do everything to make this restoration reality. Till next time. Let's pray. <laughs>